today we'll be going uh, over the anterior approach to hip replacement and how this approach is muscle sparing, potentially allowing for a faster recovery time um, and some additional benefits to this approach as well. And we'll go through a, a case example a little bit later on. Um, this is kind of a, a good example of a before uh, hip replacement hip. This is somebody who has completely lost all of their cartilage in their joint. The, the ball portion of the hip joint has essentially lost its spherical shape, um, very worn. And then over on the right here is the after um, hip replacement view uh, where we see the this metal stem, the metal ball portion and the uh, cut portion replacing that arthritic joint. So diagnosis for hip arthritis uh, can be from uh, multiple different complaints. This is usually an inability to get rest uh, due to hip pain. This sometimes wakes people up at night, um, unable to do simple tasks that require bending over. The most common complaint that I see or hear about is uh, people have difficulty getting shoes or socks on. Um, going up and down stairs can be very difficult. Sometimes uh, people have to go up one step at a time as opposed to alternating steps. Um, first few steps getting out of bed in the morning can be very difficult or folks who have been sitting for long periods of time, whether that's um, sitting in church or uh, sitting in long car rides can be very stiff, very difficult and painful to, to get up from a seated position after, after that. Um, I usually try to exhaust all non-surgical options prior to a hip replacement. Um, that includes anti-inflammatory medicines, um, sometimes physical therapy, sometimes corticosteroid injections into the hip. Um, and usually once we've kind of failed that and this is truly affecting somebody's quality of life, that's when we have the discussion for a total hip replacement. Um, there's a, a little diagram over here on the right side of the screen. It's a normal hip joint. We see nice smooth cartilage here on both the, the femur or the thigh bone side as well as the acetabulum or the, the socket portion of the pelvis where that ball and socket joint kind of functions. Um, with arthritis, arthritis is essentially a disease of the cartilage. So that cartilage becomes worn, becomes damaged. You lose that smooth surface of the joint and eventually kind of get to a bone on bone type of appearance. And we can see that, that wearing away here on, uh, you can get that both on the the thigh bone or the femur side, as well as the acetabulum or the, the socket side of the joint. What can cause arthritis? So a variety of different causes, and usually we can't pinpoint it to, to one specific thing for people. Um, arthritis is essentially inflammation of the joint and damage to the hip joint. And whether that is from osteoarthritis, which is kind of the, the run of the mill, wear and tear type of arthritis um, that we associate as we get older, um, whether that is rheumatoid arthritis, which is more of a systemic or whole body inflammatory condition that can affect multiple joints, or whether that's from somebody who's had an injury, whether that's a hip fracture um, or some other sort of injury in the past that has maybe led to, led to arthritis. We also know that there is a component for uh, genetics. So if people have arthritis in their family, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is guaranteed to get arthritis, but I would say those people are more likely to get arthritis. Um, we also know that people who do certain jobs, heavy labor, um, may be a little bit more predisposed to the, the wear and tear or the osteoarthritis as well. So getting into uh, direct anterior hip replacements. I do both a posterior approach as well as an anterior approach. Um, today, we'll kind of be focusing specifically on the anterior approach to hip replacement. Um, while the overall goal is similar to the traditional or posterior method, um, the key difference is the incision is made on the front with the anterior incision or with the anterior approach. Um, the lateral approach to the hip is, I would say, much less common. Uh, the posterior approach is kind of the classically described approach um, where the standard incision can be a little bit larger. 
um, compared to the direct anterior incision, which can be around eight to 10 centimeters. So how is the anterior hip replacement uh, procedure muscle sparing as, a, as opposed to the other approaches? So the posterior approach actually goes through the one of the gluteal muscles kind of on the back side of the hip, um, which tends to be tolerated fairly well postoperatively. However, the anterior approach completely avoids any sort of cutting of the, the muscle or tendons. Um, there are a couple of muscles on the front side of the hip called the sartorius and the tensor fasciolata that um, I go between those, those two muscles down to the front of the hip joint and basically do the entire operation through that uh, between those two muscles. Benefits of the procedure, uh, it is a smaller incision. Um, stability, this has actually been com coming into question a little bit more recently as far as uh, you know, stability between the different approaches. Um, it was historically thought that the posterior approach had a higher dislocation rate. That's actually gotten a little bit closer now um, as far as the um, long-term dislocation rate between the anterior and posterior. Some uh, studies do say that there is still a slightly higher risk with posterior approach that compared to the anterior. But again, that's um, whether that is clinically relevant at that point is uh, now questionable. Uh, the anterior approach does have a shorter recovery time, particularly within the first six weeks after surgery. Um, whether that is getting off of a walker faster or being able to walk pain-free after surgery. Again, uh, studies show that that is true within the, specifically within the first six weeks or so. After those first six weeks, the results tend to even out a little bit between anterior and posterior um, to essentially the same functional level uh, long-term. Um, shorter hospital stay for the anterior approach although I, I do send most of my folks home the next day with my posterior approaches. Um, so usually around one night in the hospital and then home the next day for, for any of my surgeries. We'll go through a sample case here very briefly. This was a, a patient in their mid sixties who presented to my clinic with uh, severe right groin and buttock pain, um, really limited on what they were able to do kind of preoperatively, um, had never walked with a cane or a walker before, uh, about two or three months before they saw me, um, very significant pain, not able to put shoes and socks on, uh, the quality of life was very poor and, um, we can kind of see on this x-ray here, this is the right hip over here compared to the left hip. Again, when we're born, we all have cartilage on the end of our long bones. We can't see cartilage on an x-ray, but we can see kind of this dark joint space that represents that cartilage. If we compare this left hip over here to the right hip, there is essentially no joint space left. It is bone on bone arthritis, very painful, very limiting as far as the, the daily function of this patient. So this patient had tried uh, everything possible, conservative in order to try to, you know, hold off surgery for as long as possible, uh, had tried anti-inflammatory medications, injections, um, nothing had really been effective and this pain continued to get worse and worse. So we decided on an anterior hip replacement and here is the post-operative view this was actually several months after surgery. This is a metal cup kind of replacing that socket portion. I will occasionally put uh, one or two screws, not always, uh, into the, the pelvis to help secure that cup. Uh, this is a metal stem that goes down into the femur or the thigh bone, and then a metal or ceramic ball that, that sits on top of that metal stem, uh, which functions like the normal ball portion of the joint. In between the ball portion and the cup portion, there is a very fancy piece of plastic called highly crosslinked polyethylene that has excellent wear properties, um, much better than we had several decades ago as far as the advancements in materials. Um, at this most recent follow-up, uh, this patient was without restriction. 
Um, the patient actually came in at two weeks postoperatively without any significant pain, uh, had not required a walker um, for the, a couple of days prior to that visit, and was overall very, very pleased with, with the progress that they had been making. Um, I do keep people on a uh, light lifting restriction for three months after surgery, mainly to help these implants uh, become well fixed. I, these are what I call press fit implants, which is kind of the standard of care in the United States at this time, where these implants are uh, prepared into the bone and allowed to actually grow, or excuse me, the bone is actually allowed to grow into those implants. There is a um, coating over this portion of the, the metal stem and around the backside of this metal cup that allows that bony ingrowth to occur to for uh, much better stability than, than cement, which was previously done. And this patient again was doing very well at the last follow-up visit. This was a anterior approach hip. Uh, 